Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Family Couch. Today I'm so excited to have as our guest, Megan Stonelink, and we're going to be talking about foster care children and how to be more effective in raising them and disciplining them. So Megan, thank you so much for being on with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> so Megan, can you tell our audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure. So I'm a therapist and um, I have worked with children and families in various capacities for about nine years. Mm. Um, I started my career working with adolescent teens in residential treatment who had um, weren't successful in foster homes and needed a higher level of care. Mm -hmm. And after that, I worked as an intensive community-based treatment therapist with children in foster care, um, trying to keep them in their placements. Right. And I've also worked as an adoption counselor. And now I focus my practice on supporting parents, foster and adoptive parents, and bio parents in their struggles um, with their children. That is a really great niche. Actually, you're one of the first therapists that I've heard personally that works specifically with foster care children and foster care families. I think that's amazing. Yeah. And you do that in your private practice, not in community anymore in your private practice, right? Uh, yeah, I opened a private practice about six months ago. Before that, it was, um, I also worked in the hospital setting and it was always in, um, in agencies. So yeah. I'm just kind of embarking on this new adventure of a private practice now. Definitely. As you were talking about some of your agency work, it, it reminded me of what I did um, right out of grad school to working in um, FSP, which is a program here in California, which is kind of, I think, the same as what you do, where it's trying to keep children in the home and outside of residential care and things like that. So it's very cool that we have those similar backgrounds. Yeah, that is cool. <laughs> so you mentioned um, this idea of like when you first started working with uh, teens that you were working with them in residential care and that meant that they probably weren't at the point in their lives right now where they could stay in foster care or stay in their homes. So what makes that determination? How would you know that the child is no longer safe in their home? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of the kids, um, if, if they had, if they were um, spending a lot of time in juvenile detention, if they were mm. kind of in and out of juvenile detention, if um, they were a threat to other children in the home, especially in a foster home, if they were an offender, either physically or sexually, mm -hmm. um, or if they just kind of kept blowing out of foster homes. And so it was like placement after placement after placement. I had one client who I think had like 15 in a year and she just sort of exhausted the resources in the area and they decided yeah. She just needed a higher level of care. Mm -hmm. And so when, when kids go to residential care, is that indefinitely or how does that work? How long do they usually stay there? It was a year long program and that was kind of flexible. Some kids left a little earlier, some ended up staying longer, mm -hmm. but um, we know from the research that children who stay in residential treatment for a longer than a year uh, run the risk of being kind of institutionalized. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's never a good thing for children. They need to be able to develop attachments and to be able to function within a family system. So about a year was typical. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I know that with when we talk about children who are in residential care, that kind of becomes the stigma around foster kids. They are just so bad. They are just so gone. That yeah. they're not able to be in a caring and nurturing home. And so how do you, and I'll just stay with you because I know you can't talk about the whole systemic issue, but how do you kind of help um, reestablish that myth and kind of reframe that myth? Yeah, I think that's such a great point. The other thing I would see is that uh, foster parents would assume that a kid didn't want to be in a home, mm -hmm. that, they, that they didn't want those connections. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, you know, I think that foster children are, are largely misunderstood in a lot of ways. There's this um, idea that they are defiant or that they are trying to be difficult. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you were in, in a position like me where I had this huge stack of paperwork and I could yeah. see, 
by the time I saw them in residential treatment, they were 15 yeah. and I could see their whole story from when they were two and the different placements they had. And um, you can get a fuller picture of, of what a human being actually looks like. And mm -hmm. instead of just focusing on the behavior and the violence and yeah. um, stuff like that, I was able to see this is a person who was never really given a chance mm -hmm. and has never really been in a situation where she's been shown empathy or she's right. been really Really cherished as a child and so she would never have learned how to be in a relationship she would never have really learned about what what um, is expected of her and she's so she's not necessarily capable of that at this point right right and I think it can be difficult for the child as well as the foster parent to make those connections because foster parents sometimes they also have a stigma around them that they don't they're, they're just there to get the check they don't really yeah. care about the kids you know so right. They're, they're both kind of operating on these stigmas. The kid thinks, oh, you just want to check for me. And the foster parents think, well, you don't even want me to be your mom or your dad, <laughs> you know? So yeah. how do you help in those family dynamics? Like what, what are good ways to kind of help foster parents and foster kids connect? Yeah, I think that's such a great point. Yeah, so when I was doing the community-based work, I would do a lot of family therapy with foster parents mm -hmm. and kids. And it would be sort of... Um, you know, meeting with them and decoding their communication to each other, like this is him trying to connect with you and this is her trying to understand where you're coming from. And it was sort of like they were communicating on different planes and just needed somebody to, you know, kind of be the go-between for them. So we do a lot of really simple stuff, even with teenagers. I would do like sand tray work mm -hmm. where, you know, they would play in the sand together and they would do different things with different characters or, you know, work on a project together, something where they kind of had the experience of being on the same team right. so that they could see that they really were in this together. Right. And, and I have to say, I, I know that that myth exists about foster parents, and I'm sure it's true in some cases, yeah. but I have met some of the most incredible people who just want to, you know, unconditionally love children and have no attachment to how the children behaves, right. and yet they can still get so burnt out because it is tremendously difficult work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think a huge piece of this for foster parents is creating community, mm -hmm. being, having other parents who are doing similar, who, who are, whose homes have a similar kind of arrangement. Yeah. Um, because, you know, your friend down the street with two bio kids is probably not going to be able to relate to what your life is like. Yeah. And having just having the support so that foster parents don't burn out. Yeah, I think that's a huge piece of it. And I think for foster parents, it can sometimes be difficult to find those because, again, I did this work as well. And I know for foster parents, they're doing a lot of things. They're going to different schools. They're going to different meetings. They're going to different right. appointments. And so... Yeah. What kind of, you know, support would you say or how would you help a, a foster parent learn how to find that community, find that self-care that they desperately need to raise children who might come into their homes with a lot more needs than maybe, you know, like you said, some of their other friends and, and the bio children that they have? I think part of it is being really realistic about how much they can do because like you said there are so many appointments there's so many meetings it's really it's incredible mm -hmm. so i think that there's always such a desperate need and you know caseworkers are just doing the best that they can to make sure that all of these kids find homes mm -hmm. and i know sometimes foster parents feel like they can't say no or they hear a story that's really heartbreaking and so they take an extra kid and i think it's really important for foster parents to kind of know what their limit is and have good boundaries around that mm -hmm. and recognize that it's really important to do what they can do for the children they have and not feel like they have to do you know, all of that for all of the children. Right. And, you know, just to create a community. And, you know, if, if there is a foster parent association or something locally, there's a good one in my area, they really support each other and they help each other out. And if they have kids at the same school and one kid forgot something and they're going anyway, you know, they can save the other parent a trip or something like that. They right. really become right. this close-knit community where they help each other be successful. Right. And I think that's really important. And I love that you talked about this idea that when, you know, they get approached for another child, how to learn how to you know, kind of listen and see, okay, do I have enough capacity to help now another child? Yeah. You can definitely want to help all the children that come through. And it's definitely hard sometimes when you are limited in space or bed space, but definitely to think about, you know, okay, I just let a couple other kids go home, you know, should I 
take on kids right now? Should I give myself a week or two to kind of get myself back together? What do you, what would you say to that? Like, would you say that a foster parent maybe should take some time between placements where when one kid goes back, whether to their parents or wherever, that they take some time before they accept another placement? Or what do you think about that? And this is your professional opinion. Yeah, I, <laughs> sure. Yeah. I think as much as possible, they should take that time. And if they have their own kids, that's a great opportunity to reconnect as their family unit as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have a really good friend who's a foster parent, and uh, they had a, an 18-month-old with severe, severe delays for a year. And, um, and so she was taking him to the eye doctor, to the neurologist, to, to OT, to physical therapy. She had to travel all over the state for him. Um, it was a huge, huge commitment. And she also had a five-year-old at the time. And so when he went to his permanent placement, they decided that they were going to take a trip together and just reconnect. And so they went to Disneyland for her daughter's birthday. Nice. And I think that that was really essential for them to sort of regroup because it's also a loss. Yeah. And even if a child moves out of the home, you know, to a permanent placement and it's a really good situation, um, if, if anyone was attached to the child in the home, which hopefully they were, I think it's a good idea to grieve and sort of process that loss and, and then move on to, to you know, to, to future children. Right, right. So, you know, now let's talk a little bit about, you know, what it looks like to, to raise healthy foster children. Because like you said, sometimes children stay and they're with you. Sometimes children come and go. And that can be really difficult to maintain kind of that stability in a foster home where the rules are set, the limits are set. Foster parents feel like they kind of have some semblance of control in their home, whatever that, that, that means for them. So what, what kind of, you know, kind of ideas or strategies would you say really work best when you're a foster parent trying to raise healthy foster children, no matter where they come from in, in your life? Mm -hmm. I think that the most critical piece for foster children is they need healthy attachments. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes foster children have been in multiple placements. Even if it's their first placement, they are being taken from, um, you know, a family member. And that's, that's a really significant attachment disruption. Yeah. And so the most important thing for them is to develop another secure attachment. Mm -hmm. And I know foster parents say, well, if it's not permanent, should I even really get attached? Yeah. And um, it's really critical for kids to have that secure attachment even if it's not going to be permanent mm -hmm. so what I always encourage foster parents to consider when they're thinking about discipline and the rules within their home is um, is this going to um, hinder or help attachment mm -hmm. and there are discipline strategies that we know will probably um, not be conducive to creating a secure attachment right. and so those strategies are probably not going to be very appropriate for foster kids mm -hmm. because they they already have this it, it feel it can feel like abandonment when they're taken mm -hmm. from their parent and they don't mm -hmm. have that connection anymore and we don't want to do anything to tap into that feeling of abandonment because that's not going to help that child to be successful right so and I was going to say, I think sometimes it can be difficult not to want to go to some of those more traditional um, parenting strategies because you're raising a child, they're in your home, but I guess you want to really be aware of the fact that even though this child is in your home, they're coming with a lot more stuff than maybe you even know about, than maybe yes. that's even in their file, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And um, I read an article recently, I, I can't remember who wrote it, but it, it was saying that children come to foster care with an invisible suitcase. Mm. And you don't know what all is in there, but they're coming with yeah. experiences, traumas, fears um, that you may not even be aware of. Mm -hmm. And they're coming with this set of beliefs about who you are, about who they are, about how the world works. And unless you really understand all of those things, I think it's safe to just operate under the, the assumption that um, we need to give them the benefit of the doubt and, and assume that if they are having a difficult time, if, if we're seeing a lot of behavioral struggles, it's probably a lack of skill and not a lack of will. Right. I really believe in the, um, the sort of... Um, mission statement of collaborative problem solving, which says kids do well when they can. Yeah. I really believe that. And I also believe parents do well when they can. Yeah. So, um, so, and that's another reason why I think foster parents need a lot of support yeah. because this is really challenging. And some of these kids have really, really challenging behaviors. Yeah. 
And when you're looking at it through the lens of empathy and trying to support children and learning new skills instead of using traditional discipline and punishments, it takes a lot more of, of a foster parent. It does. It does. Especially when you've got multiple kids in your home and they all kind of are yeah. coming with their own histories and their own experience. Right. It can be really Yeah, different. absolutely. Yeah. And so you, you were mentioning kind of this idea that kids do better, you know, do best when they can. What would you say to a foster parent who's like, you know, I get kids and a lot of times I don't know their history. I don't know what, why I'm seeing some of these behaviors. I don't know what's going on. I know the kid is bedwetting and they're 10 or, you know, the kid is 15 and always trying to leave the house always, you know, like for a foster parent, one, what should they be able to see? And I'll even say professionals who work, work with the families what can we look at to see, okay, maybe this isn't the best placement for this foster parent. Not that they can't do it or not that they don't have the skills for it, but maybe this kid needs a higher level of care or maybe they need to be in a home with these different environmental things setting up. How would you know? What, what should you tell or what can a parent, uh, foster parent, um, I guess, kind of become aware of when it comes to that? Yeah, well, the first thing I would say is don't wait to get support mm -hmm. because a lot of parents wait to reach out for support um, until they're already, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of their rope. Mm -hmm. and, and then, and sometimes they've kind of already made up their mind. Yeah. And that is too late to, yeah. because if there is support early on, there's a much greater chance of it being a successful placement. Mm -hmm. However, you know, if it seems like the child is really a threat to other people in the home, if it feels like the behaviors are so severe that it's not a safe environment, that I think that is an appropriate time to consider whether or not it needs to be a placement maybe with fewer kids, uh, maybe a different environment, maybe a different level of care. Mm -hmm. um, safety is definitely the biggest factor. And we also want children to thrive in their placements. And so, you know, kids need to be getting the level of treatment that is appropriate for them. And I think a huge part of that needs to be support for the foster parents. Yes. Agreed. And I think that's, that's another piece too, that like sometimes foster parents will say yes to a placement and then the kid gets into the home and it is a disruption to the other children in the home and to the home and things like that. Do you think that that is a salient enough reason for the parent to be like, okay, maybe I said yes, but I'm not able to give this kid exactly what they need. Is that a good reason for us to maybe reassess the placement? I think it really depends on the foster parent. Of course, we want as as few disruptions as possible for a child. And, you know, we, we definitely want a child to stay in the home as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a foster parent doesn't have all of the information. Sometimes a caseworker doesn't have all of the information. Right. And so it could seem like, um, you know, a situation where a, a child is fairly high functioning and it may turn out to be that in actuality, it's a very different situation. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to, you know, try everything that, that a foster parent can to make the placement successful. And I also think if they ultimately decide it is just a detriment to the other children in the, in the home and it's not going to be successful, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, they can't beat themselves up for it. And, right. and they have to do what's best for everyone in the home. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And I think it's hard sometimes to make that decision because you don't want mm -hmm. to give the child another rejection and you don't want to share with the child another abandonment. But also, like you said, you want the child to be able to thrive and heal. And if that placement isn't going to be helpful for them, it's not the foster parents' fault or the kids' fault or the caseworkers' fault. It's just things, it's just kind of how sometimes things look or, or the environment goes, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I know, exactly. I know we, we probably could have talked about this earlier, but I do want to get into this idea of complex trauma because I know you had mentioned it um, when we were talking. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about what is complex trauma and how does that relate to foster children? Mm -hmm. So complex trauma is trauma that a child has experienced um, from a caregiver. Mm -hmm. And it's usually over the period of weeks or months or years. So it's different in other kinds of chronic trauma in that it, it, the perpetrator was the person who was supposed to keep this child safe. Mm -hmm. And it was their, you know, it was their secure base. It was their attachment figure who was perpetrating the trauma, mm -hmm. which makes, which, you know, it's really difficult for a child to have, for a child to have that resiliency mm -hmm. to be able to move past trauma if the source of the trauma was, you know, who, who would give them resilience, essentially. Right. right. So and a lot of children who enter foster care have experienced complex trauma, mm -hmm. which makes it difficult for them to attach and adds this whole other layer in, a dis in addition to just experiencing trauma um, that can make it really challenging for them in a home. 
And so for children, again, I, I can assume that, <clears throat> excuse me, I can assume that the majority of children who are in the foster care cycle have probably, are probably, can probably, you know, kind of fit that complex trauma definition, right? As they, as more, I mean, it, it depends definitely on the child's resiliency and who they are, but maybe could you say that maybe the majority of children who are in foster care probably fit that definition for complex trauma? The majority do. You know, there are cases where um, a person will relinquish a baby at a hospital or, um, or, you know, the death of a parent. Those are certainly cases where a child can end up in foster care, yeah. but primarily it is abuse from a parent. That's, right. that's definitely the main reason why a child will end up in foster care. Right. And so these children who are coming into, you know, a foster parent's home with this complex trauma, with this kind of distrust, if you will, of caregivers and nurturing, you know, what can you, you know, you as a professional, the caseworkers and the foster parent do to kind of help rebuild maybe some of that attachment, rebuild maybe some of that trust? Yeah, I think working on connection is so critical. Mm -hmm. So for younger children, um, physical affection is really helpful, mm -hmm. obviously to the extent that the child can tolerate it. Mm -hmm. Some children have, a lot of children with trauma have sensory issues. So if they've experienced neglect, they might not tolerate certain kinds of touch very well. You know, if they've right. experienced sexual abuse, it's really important to be respectful of their boundaries. However, with, you know, babies and toddlers, if they can tolerate it, just basically carrying them around everywhere, um, having them on, on the body, just, you know, working yeah. on the, the stuff that we know promotes attachment. Mm -hmm. And for older kids, just, um, you know, doing the things that we know will help connect really understanding the situation from the child's perspective. Mm -hmm. Did they have any kind of um, exposure to, to drugs or alcohol? And really understanding what does that mean for their development, for you know, expectations of them, recognizing when our expectations of them are realistic and when they're unrealistic, mm -hmm. so that we are really understanding and connecting with where they actually are, not where we think they should be or where another child their age might be in a different situation. Right. And I think that's really important, too, because I think sometimes, and in, in you as, as the professional kind of in this area can say, trauma sometimes um, stunts growth, right? So where kids have trauma, they might be chronologically 15, but because of the trauma and the emotional things they've gone through, they might not be there emotionally or developmentally. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's this really interesting model by Bruce Perry, who um, I'm sure foster parents are pretty familiar with. He's a psychiatrist and he's done brilliant work with children who've experienced trauma. And he talks about this neurosequential model. Mm -hmm. And basically the idea is that the brain develops from, you know, our, our lowest, our reptile brain, it um, develops sequentially. Mm -hmm. And eventually we end up with the really higher functioning abstract skills, uh, executive functioning in the prefrontal cortex. Right. And when children experience trauma, that neurosequential development is interrupted. Mm -hmm. And children don't just bypass, you know, one of the steps and then keep going. It's sort of like we need to go back and, and help the child develop those skills in the lower parts of the brain before they can really continue with that development. Mm -hmm. So a 15 year old <clears throat> might actually have the emotional social skills of a 10 year old. And, you know, a 10 year old might actually have the behaviors of a five year old mm -hmm. and treating them according to development and not chronological age isn't lowering our expectations of them. It's recognizing where they're actually at in their development and parenting them appropriately. I really appreciate that, that understanding. And for those of you listening, I, I, I highly recommend the work of Bruce Perry, any of his books or any of his, uh, his articles. But this idea that we have to kind of go back and see where that child may have experienced the trauma and what skills they didn't acquire as a result of that trauma. Because I think sometimes when we look at older kids, especially older adolescents who aren't able to express themselves without, you know, having meltdowns, it can seem really incongruent with the fact that you've been on earth for 15 years, but you may still be responding to things yeah. as if you were younger. And I love that you kind of had that link for, for those of us. I feel that way, even with bio children who may have experienced trauma in the home or whatever or trauma in the world it could be that same idea. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's true. And, you know, another thing to remember is that when children have experienced trauma, they, um, they can have some kind of re-experiencing. Something can, you know, kind of cause them to go back into that 
um, into that body sense of experiencing that trauma. And we might not even know what a trigger might be for mm -hmm. them. It could be something that's so benign, and, you know, something that happens throughout our, our regular day and we have no understanding of why it just sets them off. Right. But when it does, they are in that fight, flight, or freeze mode in their amygdala, in that lower part of their brain, and they're not able to, you know, solve problems, control their impulses, regulate their emotions in that moment, and expecting them to be able to do that to be just because they're 15 is probably not realistic because they've lost the connection to that other part of their brain where they have all of those skills that maybe when they're calm, it seems like, well, she can be so rational sometimes. Right. In those moments when that trauma has been triggered, she's not capable of that. Right. That's a great distinction because I think sometimes that does happen. It's like I see them be calm all the time. So what's going on now? So I think it's a really good yeah. distinction to understand that when they're triggered in their environment, you know, that we, again, when everyone kind of can access their higher brain when they're calm, even children can. But when right. you have been triggered, it feels like, ah, you go back to maybe some of those more um, unconscious and, and survival skills that you didn't even realize were still there for the kid because they've been with you for so long or you've nurtured them for so long that you don't realize that we haven't really dealt with the trauma. And so the child is going back to those survival skills or those reptilian skills, so to speak, as, as you mentioned earlier. And I think it's a great point that you make about survival skills. And mm -hmm. it's important to recognize they were probably skills that this child needed to survive in their home if they were with an abusive or neglective parent for mm -hmm. several years. They had to adapt to survive in that home. Mm -hmm. And they might still have some of those skills that they haven't quite let go of yet. Yeah. And it's easy as adults to say, well, they're in this new environment. Why are they still hoarding food? Or, mm -hmm. you know, why do they still have these things? And it's important to recognize this is how they survived for years. Yeah. And those survival skills don't just go away overnight. It takes yeah. a long time. Definitely, definitely. Well, Megan, I know that we could probably talk about this ad nauseum, and I definitely have, you know, hundreds of more questions to ask about this topic, but I definitely <laughs> want to give you some space to let our audience know how they can connect with you and just learn more about what you do. Sure. So you can find me on my website, empathicparentingcounseling.com. And I also have um, a Facebook page and that's where I am most of the time. And that's, I don't know, you can search on Facebook, Empathic Parenting Counseling. Um, so those are the best places to find me probably. Awesome. So for those of you who are listening, <clears throat> Those links will definitely be in the show notes for this episode. So if you want to connect with Megan on some of the topics that she discussed, please feel free to check out those links to her website, and her Facebook page. Um, Megan, thank you so much for talking to us today about this topic and sharing your expertise. Thank you. It was so fun. I appreciate mm -hmm. you having me. All right. See ya. Bye. <laughs>